Welcome everybody to our AAPA webinar today. Um, Anne's going to give us our overview, and and Steve and Leslie are going to are going to pitch in as well. But first, I wanted to give everybody uh, the <laughs> waving hi. Um, I wanted to give everybody uh, some quick instructions on how to ask questions because we're going to have ample opportunity for people to to weigh in and ask questions. So on your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a questions box. There's also a chat function, but we're going to be monitoring the questions box. And so type in any questions that you have, and we will then read them to Anne and Steve and Leslie, and, and they'll be able to answer the questions for you. If you prefer to remain anonymous, because I generally read out the, the name of the person asking the question, if you prefer to be anonymous, just type anon or anonymous or something like that at the beginning of your question, and I won't read out your name. And with that, Anne, I'm going to turn it over to you. And thank you. Well, I want to welcome everyone this morning to a webinar that is really intended to open discussion and to share the thoughts that we have about our planning for our upcoming meeting, and very important to hear your thoughts and your concerns. But what I want to really start with is that I hope that today and the weeks to come find you safe and find you healthy and navigating through these very difficult and frightening times that we're facing right now and that you're surrounded by <coughs> colleagues who care for you and support you and friends and folks that you hold dear. With that being said, I also want to make sure that you know who you're going to be speaking with today. So I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves. I'm Ann Grauer. I'm a professor of anthropology at Loyola University, Chicago, and I'm the president of the AAPA. Leslie. I'm Leslie Lusco. I'm a professor of integrative bi um, biology at the University of California, Berkeley, and I have the good fortune of being <laughs> the vice president and scientific program chair as we go into this exciting, uh, um, brave new world that is scientific conferences. I'm uh, Steve Lee. I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder. I am the uh, president-elect of, of the AAPA for this year and uh, former vice president and program chair. So I can help you with any questions you might have about the 2019 or the rather ill-fated 2020 meetings. I'm Brett Burke at the AAPA headquarters and I just got noticed uh, the questions function is working well because someone already pointed out that I had the wrong name under my under my video there. So I fixed it and uh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lori Strong. I am your meetings director. So I'll be working with Leslie to make this meeting flawless and wonderful in whatever format it is. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all. So uh, what I want to do is I want to start with um, opening and telling you, first and foremost, that there will definitely be an annual meeting this year. We can we can pretty much guarantee it. We put in many hours of work and we don't quite know what the shape will be, but it, it looks as though it's going to be extraordinarily exciting and very different and new. We do expect that we're going to have to navigate through a contract that we have to figure out whether or not we'll have an in-person component to this meeting. We've had this contract for a while. We, we write contracts and sign them many years in advance, which has always worked well for us, but now it doesn't because the world has changed so profoundly. So there might be an in-person component and Leslie will talk to you a little bit more about that. But what's really important to know is that a substantial component of the meeting is actually gonna be on a virtual platform. And this, provides us with some pretty extraordinary new directions that we can begin to take. One, it begins to reduce travel costs that we've all been talking about and reducing carbon footprint. And it also increases our global participation. For a good number of years, as a community, we've talked about the fact that holding solely in-person meetings is restrictive. It's financially restrictive to many, and it's restrictive uh, professionally for others who might not be able to travel for many other different reasons. This is going to alleviate all those boundaries, we hope, and provide us with a way to begin to communicate in a fashion that we haven't had that luxury to do before. We're also, as you can see in front of you, we're going to roll back our registration fees. 
each and every year we have to calculate what these business meetings, what these uh, annual meetings are going to cost us. And this is a very difficult calculation because we're never quite sure how many people will attend. We do have a clue who pre-registers and we do have very uh, strong stipulations for these contracts that we must uh, oblige by these um, uh, fees that will be met and uh, room obligations that we have. But in this instance right now, we don't quite know what the cost will be. So we felt that it was fair then to roll back our registration fees to the Cleveland rate in 2019. And this came to for pre-registration fees for just regular members, $190 for registration and then $80 for students. And I know I've received quite a bit of feedback about registration fees already and whether or not there would be any that why aren't virtual meetings free. And the reason why virtual meetings aren't free is because these platforms are very, very expensive. We are not just going to upload your PowerPoint presentations or your PDF posters onto our website. We learned last year due to the uh, Herculean efforts by Steve Lee and Ed Hagen, who's our webpage uh, guru, that doing this takes a huge amount of work, a huge amount of time, and a great deal of resources. And it isn't necessarily as functional as we would ever want it to be. Virtual platforms, the ones that we're looking into, are very sophisticated, very nuanced, uh, and allow us functions that we would never be able to create ourselves. So these also come with uh, an extraordinarily hefty price. Leslie will also talk a little bit a bit more about what we're looking into and the why, but these fees come to close to $100,000 just for the virtual platform. So did that... I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't. Is this working? No. It, uh, sometimes you have to click on the on the screen where the um, presentation is, and then it'll let you advance it again. I've just done that, and it's not going. So I'm just going to start without it. These are just basic bullet points and we can make sure that these are clearly accessible when you uh, see this uh, as, a, as a recording because we all know anything you do live has a million glitches to it. Didn't matter how many times we practiced this this morning. So one of the other components that we can guarantee is that there's going to be a great deal of scientific content to the meetings virtual, especially that's where our main focus is going to be. We're also going to have, without a doubt, a business meeting. This has to be uh, a year where we tackle a, a number of important initiatives, not least of which is the change in the name of our organization. We're in the process now of figuring out how we're going to roll out a voting process that allows all members to participate in some way and meets the stipulations of our constitution and our bylaws. You'll be hearing more about that. The business meeting will also have a substantial amount of information about uh, reports from all of our committees and other initiatives that the AAPA has taken over the course of the year. So and it's, a, it's an important event to participate in, and this will be a year we hope where many, many more people will be able to comfortably participate. What's also been exciting is um, efforts that we have made to ensure that the awards and initiatives that we have to increase inclusion is are maintained in these next meetings. And so I'm really pleased to be able to tell you that the Pulitzer Travel Awards will continue for this year. As you knew from, know from last year, we had to cancel the meeting and we were able to make sure that those students who had paid for travel that were not reimbursable, that we were able to, to cover the costs. Even with that, we have approximately $5,000 left from our auction of last year. And the AAPA has decided that we will add more money to that, a substantial amount more money to support students. But what we've also decided is that travel is a 
appreciably different this year. We're not necessarily paying for students to come to an in-person meeting because we don't know the shape or the scope of that meeting. So rather the Pulitzer Prizes this year are really going to be to circumvent and to reimburse students for the registration fees. This means that at least twice the number of students, well over 100 students, will be able to be supported to participate in the meetings this year. That being said, I warmly welcome all students to go online, go to the AAPA website, look at the application protocol. There'll be an essay that will be posted shortly, as well as all the deadlines. We'll go through the same process of selection and you'll hear soon after whether or not you won one of these awards and your registration fee then will be reimbursed. We're also going to have student presentation awards this year that is not going away. We are absolutely convinced that one of the most important components of our organization and certainly of our annual meeting is making sure that student involvement is strong and that student voice makes up a, a prominent part of our communication, especially scholarship from our young colleagues because you're the future of the AAPA. So please, once again, go on the website, apply for these awards if you're submitting an abstract or and a, a poster or a podium presentation because we always look forward to the opportunities to celebrate your great work. So having said that, um, we I'm gonna send this over to Leslie. I don't know if you can see. So Anne, would you like me to take, why don't, would you like me to take presentation away from you for a moment so you can yes, restart your PowerPoint? I can reload yeah. it. I was having trouble with my screen freezing and maybe that's what has happened again yeah. Wow. Okay. So we're not sharing anybody's screen right now. So give uh, give that a minute and and see if you can re reload that. And Leslie, do you want to wait for her to bring it back up, or do you, are you ready I to go? I can go ahead and just start talking, and then and then the PowerPoint can catch up. Um, so I uh, am honored to get to lead the effort of figuring out what the the combination, the potential hybrid meeting might look like, and especially with this major emphasis on the virtual meeting. So we do know a number of things. One of them is the, the conference will definitely be longer than four days. So when we have been looking at these virtual conference platforms, they host meetings typically for two months, and you can add on extra months if you want. And at first, this felt like a really long time to have a conference, but then as we thought about it, we realized that this mostly virtual meeting, this longer platform really allows us to reach a much wider audience than we usually can reach because no one needs to travel as, as the president has already said. Um, also, we don't have to run things concurrently. So none of our, none of our events will run um, simultaneously. So you can attend everything if you would like to, because we will spread it out. I think it will also really help people for planning. So for people who have children like myself, we can plan ahead and know, oh, in three weeks, I really wanna be at this event and I can figure out some way to have my, my child cared for at that time. So we're hoping that, that everyone will really appreciate what that platform enables us in terms of reaching that wider audience. And also again, um, I think I forgot to mention the time zones that we can appeal to a broader range of time zones by not being constrained only to the East Coast where as our as our meeting was um, is planned to be in Baltimore. The other thing is that these platforms there. Um, some of them are focused that we're looking at. We're looking at about four different platforms right now. Um, some of them are focused specifically on catering to scientific meetings. All of them are very intuitive and they're aimed at being very user friendly. And one of the exciting things about them is that they have extra features that they really augment the experience in a way that you can't do in person. So while there are things we love about the in-person meetings, there are things that are not so great. And then there are things about a virtual platform that are wonderful that you can't do in this in this in-person meeting, although it's obviously not an exact substitute. So we're hoping and our aim is to provide uh, the virtual platform for the meeting that will be as equally beneficial to you, even though it will be different. But that's our, our mission. 
So this includes new formats for scientific engagement. So for example, with poster presentations, you'll be able to upload um, a, an audio or a short video that would go alongside your poster. Most of the, most of the uh, platforms have a chat feature that sits alongside the poster. So over the course of, of however long the meeting ends up running for, if we do it for just several weeks or for the full two months, there will be this ongoing chat function. And so you'll have a lot more engagement with each other and opportunity for networking. We're also going to have um, to make sure that there are many structured networking opportunities. So the ones that we were just, that I was just mentioning around poster sessions, but we're also envisioning having the contributed talks and posters be uploaded ahead of time, but then our recessions will run in smaller groups for a shorter amount of time, but there'll be structured conversations where, say, the, the, section, the session chair would facilitate the conversation with maybe six or eight of the, of the authors, um, and then people can chime in on that. But we're hoping that this will be a much more meaningful and deep networking opportunity. For everyone, and I don't know about you all, but when I'm at a, giving a poster, if I just have three meaningful conversations around my poster, I feel like it was an absolute success. And our goal is that it will be it will be more than that. Um, and then similarly for the talks, that there will be these organized um, discussions around them. So these networking opportunities to make sure that you meet people that you know and you'd like to see again that you get to meet people that you, you don't know but would like to know, and that we will create events where you're meeting people that you ought to know and you just don't know who they are yet. So those are our three big goals for the networking. So then what on our next one, going to things that um, other components, uh, things that we know about the other components of our annual meeting. So as you know, there's a lot of events that happen around the AAPA conference that are um, not just the scientific program. We will be reaching out to the groups that typically meet during the conference and we will try to provide as much support as possible. But just a heads up, this will likely look quite different. And one of the ways that we know for sure it will be different is that we are not going to be able to support the affiliated affiliated organizations meetings to the extent that we have in the past. And this is largely because what we have done is provide physical space. Um, and these virtual platforms are much more around organizing a scientific program. And since we don't organize the scientific programs for those, those associations, it's going to just need to look really different in terms of how those, those, those work together this year. The other thing that's going to be quite different is in years past, we've had a number of workshops and where we have just decided that we will not be hosting those workshops as part of the conference. So they will not be in the virtual, um, on part of the virtual program. So this is really different than what we've done in the past. But what we will do is that we have learned a lot over the, the last few months as we've um, started running these webinars, this monthly webinar series. And what we hope to be able to do is to pivot the webinar series to have this workshop component. And so, you know, I, I assume many of you have had the same problem I've had that you just aren't able to travel to get to the meeting early enough to make a workshop. You actually want to go to three of them, but they run simultaneous. So we're hoping that if we spread our workshop program out over the, an entire calendar year, more people can participate in those and that they actually will serve our membership better. So we're going to frame, we're using this as an opportunity to frame shift how we do the workshops going forward. And then, um, so what we don't know about the meeting yet, going to the next slide, is we have not decided on the virtual meeting platform that we're going to use. So the timeline for this is, is that usually these decisions are made about three, maybe four months out from when the meeting happens. So for example, the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology, their meeting is in very early January and they are just now making these decisions. So following that same timeline, you know, we're still a few months out from when we'll be making that decision. And then they're also, um, we are leaving open definitely the possibility of an of a com in person component in Baltimore. The pandemic is, you know, it, it changes. Um, we really can't predict exactly what April will look like, and 
So we will be working closely with the local arrangements committee and staying in touch with what the public health policies are for the state of Maryland. And if there is an ability to, to safely have a component of the meeting in Baltimore, there will be something in person for the people who are able to make it. But just to emphasize that we strongly encourage people to submit abstracts because we really, even if you know for sure you wouldn't be able to make an in-person component, the virtual platform is going to be as exciting as we can possibly make it. I'm really thrilled with all of the all of the, the, the augmented features that these various platforms have. I think it's gonna be a great program, a great scientific meeting, um, be it rather you come to in-person or you just participate exclusively in the virtual. And with that, I will pass it back to Anne. Well, thank you. So what we also don't know uh, to just kind of sum up is we're not going to be able to predict at the moment what the overall cost to the AAPA will be for these upcoming meetings. And while in past years, it has allowed us uh, some flexibility, irrespective of not knowing these years with greater uncertainty and with impending contracts that have to be met and dealt with in some fashion, that uncertainty is increased. So that leads us to kind of this, the second, what we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And our learning curve is so steep right now. So we're in the process still of just trying to figure out how do we pull this all together and how do we work so that we're, we're meeting everyone's goals and needs and, and expectations. So that's one of the reasons why we want to make sure that we have uh, offered all opportunities that we possibly can to to get your feedback, to have your ideas and your thoughts. We wanna know things that are working and things that aren't working. What are your priorities? What aren't your priorities? Once we can get and maintain this kind of gauging the, the thoughts of the membership, then we can begin to make more informed decisions, all with this background knowledge of we need to make sure that we know how and if we're gonna be able to logistically pay for this and keep the AAPA financially solvent and strong. Uh, I want everyone also to know that we, as uh, members of the executive committee, do not have business degrees. And <laughs> it takes a lot to juggle all of these different variables and different components of running a meeting and running the AAPA, and we're all volunteers. And so all the support and patience that you can throw our way is also really helpful because we're <laughs> scrambling as fast as we can in this crazy world right now to get everything done the best that we possibly can all for the benefit of the AAPA. So with that being said, I really want to, to kind of end with letting you know what we're committed to. So without a doubt, we are committed to transparency throughout this process. There are negotiations in the back that we're not gonna tell people about or aspects that we wouldn't share. The issue really is, is that we can't make quick definitive decisions without there being a recognition that it, it extends to many other aspects of our organization, all which has to be understood and accounted for before we can just take steps forward. So we wanna make sure that you know that this is what we're doing all along the way. This also means that we are committed to listening to and to meeting the needs of our members and especially having compassion for all of you. We are in this together. We're all trying to, to navigate very complicated personal and professional lives, trying to work from home and sometimes not and dealing with family and dealing with work at the same time is providing new stressors that many of us haven't faced before. But we're in this together and we have to realize that we share these stressors and that we will as a as an organization get through this we're also deeply committed as always to showing the great work of all of our members and this great work really extends past just the annual meeting now is going to be a chance where we can begin to show the great work across the globe uh, from young scholars to, to senior scholars by providing some very innovative outlets for our rigorous scientific content. And we also wanna maintain and will throughout the year be committed to maintaining opportunities for formal and informal networking. This is 
particularly important, the more we are socially distanced, I'm convinced the greater our networks and connectivity must remain. And then lastly, and definitely not least, we are deeply committed to maintaining a, and creating a very safe and a welcoming environment for all. And so on that note, I want to pass this over to Brett. I'm looking forward to hearing questions from participants and thoughts and ideas and comments as well that have come in during this program. Great. So we do have some uh, questions. And I'll remind you, if you have a question and you haven't put it in yet, go to webinar control panel, questions function, just type it in and we'll get to you. So the first one is from uh, Becky Ackerman, um, who as a separate comment said she recognizes how much work all of this is and that she's more than happy to help support. But um, her question says, good evening here. I'm chair of COD International. You talk about participation of people from outside the US, which we really appreciate. I love that we are trying to take, uh, take this moment to do that, uh, but I'm concerned about how the internationals will stitch in. How will the timing of the ta talks work? Synchronous may be a real issue internationally. Right now, for example, at 6 p.m. in South Africa, people in the Far East are asleep. More worryingly, including internationals virtually doesn't stitch them into the networks in the same way. What are the thoughts around initiatives that improve such interactions? Big question. So I I can take this. So um, you know we I thought a lot about this, and with the actual conference itself, I think we do need to choose a time zone to root it in. And but that what we can do is instead of running things from like eight o'clock in the morning until ten o'clock at night, is that we will move things to more like the middle of the day on the East Coast. So that then we are catching people, um, you know, farther to the west, and then hopefully as many people to the east as possible as well. But at a certain point, we just can't we can't have live events for people everywhere because um, the earth, you know, it's just impossible. But what we can do is make sure that a lot of our of our content is. Um, asynchronous so that things are uploaded and available and so that for example those chat speech functions can be running all the time and people can chime in at whatever is convenient for their time zone um, and then hopefully by spreading out some of the other um, other events um, so that the main emphasis for live things will be during perhaps that that noon to five or six o'clock in the eastern time zone um, that if we have some of our other um, events like those um, uh, the sessions, you know, like 45 minute session meetings, we can sprinkle those throughout the day. They need to still be catered to the East Coast time zone just as a rooting feature for the conference. But hopefully that will, people will be able to kind of figure out um, how to attend ones that work in their time zone. But this is something we're really, we really are trying as an organization more generally to address as well. Um, and our webinars allow us a bit more flexibility. And so, for example, our October webinar is actually running, I think, at nine o'clock East Coast time in order to, to be very early morning um, in, in Australia and New Zealand and, and parts of Asia. And so we're trying to accommodate in that, that way, shape, or form. But we, are, we recognize that being headquartered here in the United States does, does provide some limitation on that, unfortunately. And that, Oct that October webinar, that's 9 o'clock p.m. Uh, East Coast time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yep. Um, so this is a timely one. Uh, this one is from uh, Chris Stantis. It says, what is the hash hashtag for the AAPA webinars? I don't know that we have one. We should have one. We we do, and there was a little bit of back and forth, so we didn't do a very good oh. job. Sorry, I'm still not the best at Twitter. I'm trying. Um, so hashtag capitalized AAPA and then webinars, lowercase, and I think we should go with plural so that it can apply to many. But thank you for that question. Excellent. Um, the next one is from Melanie Beasley, and it says, will deadlines for abstracts be changing? This was asked on the student Facebook page last week. Some are worried about the time they were locked out of labs and now they the need to collect data before the abstract deadline. 
Right. So I can take that one too. Uh, I have so much sympathy for that. You know, I, I have graduate students that would love to be in the lab right now. And unfortunately, we are still in just phase two here on the Berkeley campus. So I'm really sympathetic to that. Unfortunately, we just really can't change the deadline for abstract submissions. It will still stay as October 15th. And the real limiting factor when we talked about this, is there any way that we could add some time into that? But that our, the back end load of organizing the conference is actually going to be even bigger and more complicated than it has been in years past. And that October deadline has always been a crunch and, and, and really difficult for the program committee to meet and to make sure that everything happened in time for our just our regular planned meetings. And now adding in this 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 extra factor to all of this. And, and I'm and I'm really sorry that we can't we can't bid, give people more room, but um, we want to make sure that it's a good conference. Um, and so we just had to stick with that um, with that deadline. Yeah, I, I can add to that that Leslie is absolutely correct. It's really, really difficult for the program committee to do its work on the schedule that we have with which obviously starts October 15th. Recall that it was September 15th. Um, that obviously doesn't solve the problem, but I, but the main issue is making sure that we get the abstracts reviewed, publishing a high quality abstract issue, and 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 so forth. Excellent. Um, this one is an anonymous question. It says, "I was wondering if you could talk a bit about issues of accessibility for the 2021 meetings, i.e., what efforts in terms of, for example." considering access to and expenses for internet are being made to ensure that all AAPA members are able to participate? So I think that's a great. Oh, Anne, do you want to take that? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think it's a really, really important point and one that um, as we will um, we will add that to our list of things to be really mindful of and I, and I appreciate being that, that coming up in this conversation um, and that when we talk to the various platforms I think making sure that there's a simplicity to them that people working over slower internet connections um, are able to 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 access all of that and we'll make sure that we ask about that and look into that when we're making those decisions so thank you for, for bringing that up Great, and I think there's some opportunities for other kinds of accessibility issues to be able to be really well addressed, right? So some of these platforms have closed captioning uh, built in and things like that that'll that'll help us as well. So um, yep, these are all good questions. Um, our next question is also anonymous. It says, does extending the length of the meeting lead to an increase in the virtual platform cost? And Laura, you might know the answer to that one. I, I don't I don't think it's based on time of the meeting, but Lori will know more than I do. It, it, um, yes, it's a small the longer you host it, um, it's a small increase monthly. So it's you get a ho you get it hosted for a couple of two months and then after that it's maybe a hundred dollars a month. So it's a pretty small cost um, comparatively for all things. Great. Um, this next question is from Robert O'Malley. It says, has AAPA considered expanding elements of the meeting to be open to the public or ways to facilitate attendance and engagement with communities and organizations outside of AAPA? For example, community leaders, science teaching organizations, science communication organizations. We have started these discussions We've certainly over the years uh, had greater uh, emphasis on outreach. We have outreach to K-12. I know that the COD has done some amazing work as well for out outreach in local communities where we're hosting our meetings. This is a great opportunity for us to begin to explore new avenues for ways to communicate by allowing a session or a symposium or a, a plenary talk have that become open to the, the public or open for uh, educational or districts or systems, you know, uh, globally to be able to either tap in as it's live or begin to have a, a link for the recorded session. These are directions we're talking about, but they're in its infancy because we're overwhelmed with just how to manage the mechanics of a, of a meeting for registrants. As we get closer to 
perhaps the time of the meeting, we can explore some other possibilities. It's definitely on the burner, but it's nothing that we've been able to actually come up with a, a plan or a, a specific component or direction that we'll take now at least. Could I also add that our webinar series are um, recorded and then uploaded to YouTube and served on our website. And we're hoping that those might also provide a nice resource for, um, while they're not live, um, obviously, you know, after the fact, but that they can be used in teaching and, and outreach as well. Great. Okay, we've got, a, we've got several more questions that have come in. This is great. Keep them, keep them coming, everybody. Um, so uh, this next one, I think this is a really good one. Hold on, let me find this. Ah, there we go. Um, this one is from uh, Bridget Holt, and it says, can students resubmit abstracts for presentations that were not able to make because the LA meetings were canceled? I, I can take this one. <laughs> so, so yes, you know, my initial reaction when we when we had to cancel the meeting in LA was why don't we just do exactly the same meeting again? Because boy, my job would be easier, right? Um, but as as was pointed out, the executive committee had really carefully considered this. Um, we published the abstract volume, and so those abstracts are published, and then we run into issues of of plagiarism and self plagiarism, and so uh, while you can use a, a very similar project, you know, perhaps you want to just reanalyze the data in a different way, um, frame it differently, you know, as long as it's not, you know, it can't be exactly what you were proposing to do before, um, because your abstract and your title is published. But you can modify that and update and revise, you know, new things happen, new papers have come out, new frameworks come about, new analytical methods, and that then would update that research. So it does need, it can't be exactly just because we've already, we have published those abstracts. Great. Steve, did you want to add to that? No, I think you, you, you captured the executive committee decision very well from, from last year. So um, we, we, we want to be able to present new research in our abstract issue each year. Great. Um, the next question came in with its own answer. So this is a creative one. <laughs> Uh, this one is from Amy Sullivan, who's on our staff, and it says, can I be a sponsor for the 2021 meeting and the webinars? And the answer is, yes, you can. So, <laughs> yes, you should even. I'll go a step further. So, just, uh, you're going to get an email back from uh, after this after this webinar. If you want to just reach back out from, uh, just reply to that, uh, you can reach out if you're interested in being a sponsor. Um, we would love to have you. And our webinars, uh, I'm sure our meeting will be the same way, but our webinars have had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of attendees. So it's a great opportunity. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, Amy. Um, uh, this next one is anonymous. It says, will membership be polled so leadership can get information about what the members want for the 2021 meeting and year-long offerings? For example, taking on a major cost, $100,000 cost for virtual platform alone, might not be something that the membership wants. So will we be polling to ask questions? We hadn't intended to poll to ask questions, but to hear responses. We had made a decision amongst the XCOM that the best way to hold our meetings next year was to do this on a virtual platform, especially given the unknown of holding that in-person meeting. Our alternative choice could have been not to not to have a virtual meeting, not to take on this expense and go in this direction. But we feared that what would happen is the same as happened last year, that decisions about showing up, being able to hold an in-person meeting are only made at the last minute when we find out what state, local government regulations end up being, which makes us extraordinarily right, right. vulnerable, not only as an organization financially, but as individuals who have made reservations and plans and, and done our work and created our our PowerPoints and our posters already so that the disruption to yep. our personal lives end up being so great. So this is why we made this decision early on. I think though that it's an excellent question because perhaps what we need to do is make sure that we provide a means for members to come up with other options that they feel might 
better serve our community and to hear what those other options are. We are, this will be, we'll be in flux for a long time. This isn't gonna be solved by next year because as next year comes around, we're going to have to start thinking, well, how do we cope with this year afterwards? I, not thinking there's going to be a vaccine and everything will be solved by December. Just my thought there. So this is gonna be a continued dialogue I, for the next couple of years and all input is important. So I, I like the idea of, of putting together a poll, a way to formally hear what members are thinking. Thanks a lot for that idea. Yeah, and, and two follow-ups. Uh, first off, the platform won't be 100K. It won't be cheap, but it won't be 100K. Um, good point. Um, and um, uh, second, this meeting is sort of sufficiently complex that just trying to do it as a bunch of Zoom calls or a bunch of just go to webinar webinars like this. It's just it, we would lose the we would lose the community component of it, and and just being able to engage the member. We can't cancel the meeting two years in a row because the the mission of the organization is at jeopardy then, as well as the memberships. So I think I think this is a it's a solid plan. Okay. Um, but I actually add one more point to that. That you know, in yeah. our con in our conversations that we have had in in making these decisions was also that by not having a giant meeting as usual in person we actually don't incur a lot of expenses that we would have and so the financial thing might not be all extra cost in order to go into this nice virtual platform um right. it's possible that it will actually be i mean Anne knows much more about the money than i do and i probably shouldn't speak to that but <laughs> We spend that on coffee. Person. <laughs> yes. Especially now that we have no idea what in person could possibly look like. That's right. that's the biggest possibility for expense, for penalty fees, for having to renegotiate. So that's what makes these years more tenuous than others. Once we've figured out how we can perhaps plan and predict better, this uncertainty will be reduced appreciably. Right. Okay, uh, this next anonymous one uh, says, um, has the call for paper, ha has the call for abstracts gone out? Because I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> so we will open up the, the abstract submission site on Friday, on September 18th. Um, and so, yes, we that news, the, the call for that will, will go out. It's technically on the website, but we will make sure to send out an email blast so everybody doesn't miss that. Thank you. And this next question is from Maha Saseli. It says, will the undergrad research symposium deadline be in January as in previous years? That's a great oh, so, Yeah, thank you. Actually, I have not I have not done the planning for that yet. Um, and, but but I will I will get on that and, and work that out. Um, I, I appreciate them raising that. Excellent. Um, so this next one is anonymous, and we probably don't know the answer to this yet, but but we'll have a general sense. Uh, what will the lead up time be for posting presentations if the talks are preloaded? Will we need to have talks posted two weeks before, a month, or what? Yeah, we don't we don't know that yet, um, just because we haven't chosen the platform. Um, and and we haven't made those those fine those more more specific details, but we will definitely keep in mind that everybody has been planning on a mid-April meeting, um, and that we wouldn't ask you to upload your talk you know a month ahead of time. To me, that just seems that seems like a really huge ask. That's um, way beyond what what sort of the normal expectations of the of one's schedule, academic schedule. So we will try to keep everything um, as as um, in, in concert with the usual academic schedule we all follow as much as we possibly can. If that helps to answer that. Lori, have other organizations uh, yeah. set up deadlines based on? You're yeah, welcome. it's um, some are a month, um, but some are there. Typically, it's about two weeks because we do want to make sure um, that we go in from our end and take a look at those presentations, make sure the links work OK and there weren't there aren't any problems. And when you're looking at that volume 
of presentations, it'll take um, you know our staff some time to get in there and do that spot checking. So that's why it's not just a week or a day before. So it'll it'll give us that opportunity so we can get back in touch with you if there's any problems. All right, see, we're all learning lots, and so I, I take back. <laughs> we will all learn to frame shift into this new world. <laughs> yeah. And if I if I may, we we typically complete the abstract review process within the first two weeks of December, and so to speak to uh, the need to get to a presentation together to do any production work and so on and so forth, that would be a, a really good time to to be concerned with that and to make sure that the the presentation is how you want it to be for the for the meeting. So that gives you a little bit more information on the timeline that you that you might expect. And again, we're trying to keep everything within you know straightforward limits. Excellent. Um, we have several editors in our midst uh, that are also uh, friends of Anne that are a, a little sad that her last name is misspelled. So Anne, if you want to click on the attendee list and then click on your, I can't fix it. And fix you, click on your own name, it'll let you edit your name. So it's thank you, editors out there, one and all. Att attendee list and then click on your and then uh, uh click on your own name and it should let you fix it. Oh my um, gosh. But it's the, the 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 stress of the situation is real, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so um this next one is from uh, Tisa Lewin. It says, during the presentation, it seemed it was suggested that most of the meeting will not be live. May we have some clarity on that? My personal interest in attending concerns live opportunities with interaction. And yes, I see so your name is fixed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so networking events will all be live, um, other than like chat functions and, and that. But we will definitely have organized um, a number of different networking events that are live. Um, the, the goal is that all of the invited symposia will run live, that the plenary um, will run live. We will have a number of features that all run live. What I'm looking at mostly right now is that the contributed posters and contributed um, podium presentations, those would be uploaded ahead of time, except that then there would be a live event that would be more of, a, of an organized conversation with a session chair to help build that network in the conversation amongst those those authors and the people who would like to be a part of that conversation. Great. We have a couple more questions and I'm just going to remind folks we do have enough time uh, that we could probably field a few more. So if you have additional questions, just, just send them in. Uh, this one is from Austin Lawrence. It says, will there be support or will there be student support for registration fee waivers or reimbursements for the 2021 meeting as there have been in past years with volunteering at the meetings. So, it's Lori, yeah. I can take that. Um, so, yes, I'm going to just go out there and say yes, because we do need, um, as even with this virtual platform, there are places that we will need help, kind of like in session rooms, like typically that the students do. So we will have opportunities for volunteers um, this year that registration, um, you'll get re reimbursement for registration. Great. Okay, uh, the next one is from Sarah Lacey and it says, will this information be posted somewhere in written form? The CSU has frozen all employee travel through the academic year. Therefore, there are no travel conference funds. We're currently petitioning my campus to still fund online conference registration, but it helps to have websites to point to to prove that these meetings are happening. And so I'll, I'll point out that the video of this will be posted for sure, um, probably in the next couple of days. But, and I, I don't know if you wanted to answer the written up version. Yes, in fact, Leslie and I were just talking about this last year when we canceled the meeting or when leading up to it and with Steve as well, we produced a fax sheet so that you could click on the important questions you had and get answers. Leading up to this webinar now, we've had to make a lot of decisions. So we've held off posting our fact sheet since we didn't have as many facts as we have right now. We will get this posted within this week, I think, and we'll begin to add to it as we have more decisions, as more questions come along that we feel that we need to address 
directly. So that will be on the website and we'll make sure that it's prominent so that you can use it and send it the link to whomever you need to. You know, what we could probably also do is in the email blast that goes out and um, calling for the abstracts is we could make it really clear that there is a virtual component um, in addition to hopefully having some in-person one. And that might then be an email that would suffice that as well. We'll try to write that so that it indicates that. Yeah, and, and, and if, we'll make the offer you, also. Go ahead, Lori. If you have questions that aren't on the FAQs, um, you can go ahead and um, email those in to us and we can um, get some answers for you. Maybe it'll get added to the FAQs if people are asking it enough, but um, we'll try to get as much info to you as we have. Yep, and we can certainly send support letters for you to your or support emails, whatever, to your to your admin folks if that helps. So we don't have any more questions, but we have one more comment. And I wasn't sure if I was going to read it, but I think I will because I think it's really a neat uh, it's a neat reminder of how important uh, since we couldn't meet this year, having webinars, how important this is. So it just, it's from Arian Mays and it says, hi, Anne, great to see your face. <laughs> so it's, it's just nice to have a little. My name's been misspelled somehow for this well. whole <laughs> I don't see pictures, so I never noticed it. <laughs> but it's been nice to virtually meet everyone on this webinar. It's going to be great to have this kind of opportunity throughout the year. Having annual meetings was wonderful. It's always been one of the high points of my, you know, professional, you know, year for many decades now, and I sorely miss that we don't get to meet face to face to the same same extent that we have in the past. And although it's virtual, it's been fuel for my soul to be able to see so many individuals and to hear comments and to get questions from you know, all the participants in webinars and hopefully all the participants in the future webinars as well as our annual meeting. This is just the beginning, I think, of a really exciting direction that the AAPA can begin to take that addresses so many of the issues that we've discussed yeah. for, for a very long time and we'll be doing the best we can there's so many directions we can take, so much more we can do, so many mistakes that we're going to make. Uh, but it's all part of the <laughs> process and it all requires feedback from everyone, which is always, always warmly welcomed. So thank you. Yeah, and we, di we did just get one more question that I think really feeds into that point. Um, and this is from Terry Ritzman. It says, has there been any discussion about what, if any, of the changes that are being considered due to COVID-19 might be worth maintaining once things are back to normal? Uh, in other words, some of these changes, what of these changes will make things better, not just from being safe from COVID? And I think that's a really big point. I mean, this has pushed us to be um, sort of more innovative. And I think the webinar series is a great example of that. That was put in place because we couldn't get in, in uh, couldn't be in the same place. So I think there's going to be a lot of things that we're able to really use to expand our our, our net here. I if, if I could raise a point, I, I just want to thank Anne for her leadership over the last, um, I guess we really started worried, being worried eight months ago, Anne. <laughs> um, and I thought that the way that you led us through the uh, meeting cancellation was just exceptional. And I want to appreciate everything that you've done over the summer to kind of keep things going. And also, Liz Leah, who has thought profoundly about what we need to do for meetings and the the features that our our organization, our association, really values. And so um, that's just wonderful um, vision and leadership to get us through this um, this odd period. You paved the way, Steve. Thank you so much for the Herculean effort dealing with the, the meeting cancellation, you and Anne and, and everyone at Burke Associates. Uh, Absolutely. Deep admiration. Also, of thank the membership, the, the amount of feedback yes. that we received in support and ideas and suggestions uh, and willingness to, to participate in any way possible to make things work for the benefit of the organization and the benefit of all of our participants was absolutely extraordinary. I don't know of any other scientific organization that has this kind of heart and sense of community that we do and it's something that i think i know i cherish and i hope that others no matter where you are in your career or where you are around the globe you feel the same way 
absolutely. All right, well, thank you everybody. And it looks like, um, oops, hold on. Let's see if we have, ah, if we have needs or ideas for time sensitive topics that might work for a webinar, should we contact Leslie? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Which is a perfect yeah. segue into I want to just make sure everybody knows about our webinar for next month. Um, so, so please join us speaking speaking of using the virtual platforms to really expand our, our global reach. Uh, we have we have a webinar focused on biological anthropologists in Australia and New Zealand. So it might be staying up late for some of you <laughs> or early in the morning for others, but but please join us. Excellent. Absolutely. I, I think that's it. We could actually give everybody uh, two and a half minutes back of their day. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks all of you out there who have participated. It's greatly appreciated. And I look forward to seeing you on any screen, whether it's big or small, or perhaps <laughs> even in person. Please stay safe and stay well and connected. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.